The automobile is a huge problem. It is a liberating force in the rural areas. It really doesn't work in cities, and it is totally unsustainable. But it's, it's uh, a very attractive trap. If you think about uh, it from a politician's point of view, you spend a dollar on a highway, and then uh, everybody else spends $10 to buy the automobile, to buy the fuel. It's a huge sucking sound of money leaving your economy. Uh, and uh, there's a challenge in China uh, that uh, was just described with the national government uh, uh, appearing to be national, but actually there are different industries pushing for their, indus their own interests, and there are cities looking to their interests. I think that's actually a sign of hope. If you had a unitary policy in China, it would probably be dominated by the automobile, and I think that would be a tragic mistake for China. Uh, the fact that the cities are going to have something to say and have some independence is the best hope. But I think we have to respect the challenge that the Chinese uh, cities are facing. As you see on these images, uh, China is growing incredibly. Uh, it's uh, much bigger but similar to what went on in the United States from 18. 90 to 1920, uh, the cities that were lucky in the United States were cities like New York that bet on subways. Uh, and I, I, I love your book, David. Uh, I think it should be required re reading for everyone uh, because it shows that uh, contrary to the bias, uh, Manhattan is the most sustainable place in the United States. Uh, and we would do well to emulate what goes on in Manhattan. But uh, New York and, to a lesser degree, Boston, we were lucky because when we were building the infrastructure in our cities, there were no autos. So we had to go heavy on subway. Uh, China's got a much more difficult challenge because they have the choice of the automobile, which is a real trap. Uh, I don't think that it's – if we think about the Kyoto – protocol uh, that sort of says, well, everybody should go back to 1990 levels of greenhouse gas production. Uh, think about that for a minute. It's the 1990 levels of greenhouse gas production that have produced the problem we're now experiencing. So getting back to 1990 is way too modest a goal. Most of the trouble has been caused by us in the United States. So we can't, I think it would be ridiculous to assume that China should take the burden of undoing what we've done and continue to do in the United States. The, the motivation for China that I think uh, we should encourage is for China to look at its own self-interest. Uh, the cities in the United States that are weathering the increase in energy prices better are the cities like New York that have not bet so he heavily on the automobile. And as, the, as fuel becomes scarcer and more expensive, I think the auto is a big financial and economic mistake. Uh, but again, it's a much tougher challenge for the Chinese cities because they don't have the, the luck that New York had of having only one option, which was bet on transit. They have the challenge of the possibility of betting on the auto, too. Uh, they have national industries that are pushing the auto. Uh, they have an upper middle class that wants the auto. That's a political force that's difficult to deal with. So it's a big, big challenge. Uh, and and I, I, I think we, we need to be respectful of that challenge uh, and not preach to China about what's good for the United States, but ask the Chinese to think about what's good for China, and maybe we'll see the Chinese make wiser decisions than we have. 